The Bolivian Ombudsman's Office has confirmed the death of Calixto Wanaku Aguilar, who was shot in the head by forces of repression earlier this month. Wanaku Aguilar died in hospital and becomes the 10th person to die in the Sincata massacre on November 19th during a military and police operation against demonstrators blocking access to a fuel depot near the city of El Alto. Working class and indigenous Bolivians had been demonstrating against the de facto authorities following the right-wing coup in Bolivia until an agreement to hold new elections was made. Senator for the Movement Towards Socialism, Adriana Salvatierra, has demanded an investigation into the 32 deaths that came from military and police repression following the coup against President Evo Morales. With a man, the impartial investigation by international organizations of the 32 deaths reported following military and police repressions, taking into account of disproportionate use of public and military forces, we demand care of the wounded, compensation for victims' family, and the immediate release of detainees who were arrested without due process. We also demand that any responsibilities be determined in a personal manner and call for respect and freedom of the press, condemning censorship of the media. This May request has been made by sectors of El Alto, Cochabamba and the north of Potosí, from meaning sectors that demand the approval of Supreme Decree 4078. The president of Bolivia's lower house, Sergio Choque, has said that as a Bolivian citizen, President Evo Morales has every right to vote in new elections. He also called on the transitional government to stop its repressive attitude against the movement towards socialism party. Obviously the constitution is a law, but under article 410, it clearly states our rights as citizens to be elected to office and also to vote. In this farm work, the president as a Bolivian citizen has every right to participate in elections. It is true that there are legal processes started against him, but they are poorly focused. Now, Bolivia's deposed president has outlined how the U.S.-backed coup in his country was masterminded well before the elections commenced. He was speaking at a news conference in Mexico City. Morales also called for an investigation into the murders of civilians as well as injuries which have occurred since the coup. They burnt homes, cars of ministers. And has anybody been arrested? No. And that's why I'm calling this news conference. There's no investigations, no arrests. But recently, in 10 days, there are more than 30 people who have been shot dead by the police and the armed forces. More than 400 people injured, wounded, more than a thousand arrested unjustly. They try to make, claim they're guilty of subversion, planting weapons on them. The new authorities of the de facto government are experts in planting evidence. In an exclusive interview for Telesur, the mayor of Binto in Bolivia, Patricia Arce, called for an end to the persecution of mass party officials. Arce was kidnapped and humiliated by far-right opposition protesters after the October 20th election. I really have cleared my conviction. They could have cut my hair and hurt me, but the feeling and ideas are intact. And the only thing I want to ask to the whole country is to really think about it. It's inhuman what they have doing to our people. For me, it's something that I never really imagined that Bolivia will live through these atrocity moments and so many people with our country. The truth is very frightening and a really very threat because it's not only Patricia. It's so many women who could have suffered this. It doesn't seem fair that by thinking differently, they have harmed so much person.
muy, muy espantoso lo que estamos. As we continue with our report on protests, Chile's trade unions concluded a two-day general strike on Tuesday. But they say the stoppages will continue until the government decides to listen. Our correspondent Leonel Retamal has the latest from Santiago. The main trade union confederations are reporting a very favorable balance sheet of Tuesday's general strike. They say the protests in the streets kept up their momentum. In fact, they were the biggest protests since the agreement reached in the Congress on November the 15th for a constitutional referendum. The main demands of the protests were an end to the repression and justice for human rights abuses. Only yesterday, the Chilean prosecutor's office said there were more than 2,600 complaints of human rights abuses that are under investigation. The unions say they have had no response from the government to their list of 10 demands, which include an increase in the minimum wage as well as pensions and health care. They say they're expecting a meeting this week with the government to discuss these demands. They're also demanding real participation in the drawing up of a new constitution. They think the existing agreement is fundamentally deficient because it doesn't take into account the social movements. Another controversial issue in Chile right now is President Sebastián Piñera's proposal for a law that would give the armed forces control of strategic locations. That includes hospitals, highways, supply depots and power plants, among others. And it also gives legal immunity to members of the armed forces carrying out those duties. During Tuesday's strike, several union leaders said this would not solve Chile's basic problems, which are deep-seated social issues, and that such militarization would only aggravate the violation of human rights. Other leaders said this was a clear sign of the authoritarian path that the government has chosen to take, and that other international experiences have shown that social problems cannot be solved by putting more soldiers and police on the streets. Some members of parliament have also criticized this bill, which the president presented to Congress yesterday for its urgent consideration. That was our correspondent Leonel Retamal with that report. Now, members of the public have taken to the streets as the national strike against the government's economic and social policies continue. Our correspondent Hernan Tobar is in Bogota and has the details. We are at the intersection of Carrera Septima and Calle 37, where members of various trade and worker unions have gathered to march to Bolivar Square. This demonstration is not limited to Bogota, but is happening across the country. People are marching against the government's economic and social policies, which includes the privatization of state-owned companies, as well as neoliberal labor, pension and health reforms. On Tuesday, social leaders who called for the national strike held a meeting with President Ivan Duque, where they outlined their demands. But the president said the discussion must be held at a larger level to include owners of large companies from various sectors. The social leaders said that the talk should remain between them and the government. Now, indigenous communities have blocked the Pan-American highway between Cali and Popayan, and among their demands is a call for the government to end the genocide of indigenous people in Colombia. After the break, we hear exclusively from two Caribbean leaders about foreign intervention in the region. Don't go anywhere. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays, only on Telesur.
Welcome back. Chairman of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and Antigua's Prime Minister Gaston Brown is calling on countries to adhere to the UN principles of non-interference in the affairs of other states. Brown made the appeal at a recent signing ceremony with China. The People's Republic of China believes in the principle of non-interference in the affairs of other states. That is a principle that Antigua and Barbuda holds there. They believe in mutual respect, which we also hold there. And they also believe in mutual trust. We have noted that there has been growing mistrust globally among nations, mistrust that continue to create conflicts, even conflicts between China as a great power, an emerging superpower, and the United States. I believe that the relationship between Antigua and Barbuda and the People's Republic of China could be an example for others, which will help to promote global peace and prosperity. In fact, China believes in peaceful coexistence. And if other nations would adopt those policies, I believe that we will have a more peaceful world. Also at that signing ceremony, Antigua's PM requested a further 20 million US dollars for the expansion of UE's Five Islands campus. The signing was for a grant under the government's affordable housing project with 11 million US dollars and a quarter million education grant toward a multimedia center at the Five Islands campus. The Prime Minister of Dominica, Roosevelt Skerritt, has said the opposition, backed from abroad, is trying to stop elections from taking place on December 6th. He was speaking in an exclusive interview with Telesur's Madeleine Garcia. Well, you know, we are having general elections in our country on December 6th. And there are attempts to derail or to prevent this from happening. Uh, and the opposition is seeking to create a situation in the country that would give one the impression that the country is not stable, that there are riots, and there, is, there are serious conflicts taking place in the country. And therefore, it would appear to the outside world that the country is ungovernable. And, and therefore, that situation would not allow for the holding of elections in our country. Now, the opposition is saying that the reason why they're taking those actions um, is because there have been no electoral reform in our country. Now, this government, which I have had the honor to lead, has done all what is required to ensure that there is there is the, the, the electoral reform that's required. But the legislation which was required to be passed in the parliament to allow for the reform to be completely effected was blocked by the opposition. So on one hand, they say this, they support electoral reform. But on the other hand, they are not prepared to support the actions which are required to get the electoral reform in place. And regarding the elections in Dominica earlier on, we spoke with Ralph Gonzalez, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He accused the opposition of creating contention. The election train has left the station legitimately. And it's on its way to election day. If anyone thinks that the election is proceeding unconstitutionally, you can go to the court. It's unlikely that the court is going to take you, ser take, ser take you seriously because the, you really can't stop an election as such before it is taken. So even except if there's a national emergency and the Constitution prescribes limits in relation to how the executive can act in relation to postponing an election during a state of emergency, what they want to do is to ca cause confusion for Prime Minister Skerritt. The opposition wants to cause confusion. So, it, and create disorder so that 
an emergency situation would arise. Dominica, which has a very strong, this government and Prime Minister Skerritt, a strong anti-imperialist record. Their imperialist forces want to get rid of him. It's as simple as that. And of course, the local opposition has its own set of reasons. But the elections, the election framework is free and fair. It's a very sound one. And um, every electoral system can be improved, however good it is. But the fact of the matter is this, the one in Dominica is sound, and you're going to have free and fair election. And when Skerritt wins, again, as is likely, you, you may have trouble from the opposition, and the imperialist forces may try and stoke those opposition forces. But those of us who know what is happening, we just have to be prepared to defend the people of Dominica and defend the government in the pursuit of the attainment of the highest democratic ideals and free and fair elections, which I'm sure we're going to have in Dominica. The third energy oil and gas conference started on Wednesday in Havana, Cuba. The meeting organized by the Union Cuba Petroleo represents an important event for potential investors interested in the country's resources. It features presentations by 50 leaders and experts in the energy field in front of hundreds of delegates from public and private organizations. According to official figures, Cuba's oil and gas exports amount to 3.5 million tons a year. In spite of the difficulties caused by the economic blockade, the government of President Nicolas Maduro is stepping up efforts to ensure decent health care for everyone in Venezuela. Our correspondent went to the main heart hospital in Caracas to find out more. The Vargas Hospital in Caracas is a benchmark for cardiovascular medicine, and all this week it is holding special sessions. Carlos Padilla came with his children from Maracay to get the treatment he needs. Here, the state supplies for free, but will cost him between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars in a private hospital. I came here to get my arteries unblocked, and I have to say it's a very good alternative for me, and I really believe they can help me. The Venezuelan government is making a big effort to help people and improve the situation. The aim is to allow people to get better in spite of the circumstances. Cardiovascular problems account for a third of all illnesses and deaths in Venezuela. In this hospital, 240 people are receiving treatment, and 70 operations are carried out every month. In the special sessions this week, 50 patients will get surgery, Antonio Fernandez is one of them. It's very good. They are quick and very caring. Dr. Mauro Herrera is the head of the heart unit. He explains the impact of the blockade imposed on Venezuela by the United States. The idea is to develop blood units throughout the country. That's the plan which is being put into practice now. But remember that we have a blockade which reduces our ability to buy spare parts and repair or maintain our equipment. This is the big challenge which the state has to get around, how to get these supplies here. And it's not just a problem with U.S. companies. All foreign companies dealing with Venezuela are sanctioned. We know very well where all this situation comes from, from the United States and imperialism. This whole war is not just against Venezuela, but against all countries. Look at Chile now, and they have intervened in our sister country, Bolivia. And the patients are not just Venezuelans. Foreigners, especially from Colombia and Ecuador, are also being treated as part of this program, a joint effort by several ministries to overcome the crisis and guarantee health care to all who need it. Still to come. Will a huge voter registration boost help the UK Labour Party? We'll take a look in just a minute. Our actions have an impact on the environment. our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. 
Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve, and protect your green zone. Wednesday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. At least 19 people have been killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo by a suspected group blamed for massacres that have sparked protests against the United Nations peacekeeping mission. The Allied Democratic Forces are accused of being behind the attack, a group that was also reported for the attack on Saturday that left 15 people dead. Fear and anger have prompted local people to take to the streets, accusing the authorities and the UN of failing to protect them in demonstrations that have led to seven deaths. Peacekeeping mission there reported that 19 people were killed in a new attack by suspected ADF elements early this morning in Maliki, uh, northwest of this, the village of Oicha. The Nigerian army has released more than a thousand detainees suspected of having links with the Boko Haram militant group. The freed inmates, including five women, were handed over to civilian officials for rehabilitation and reintegration. They had been incarcerated in a military facility in the northeast city of Maiduguri. More than 35,000 people have been killed and 2 million displaced due to fighting with Boko Haram in the northeast of Nigeria, which has also spread into neighboring Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, prompting a regional coalition to fight the organization. Benin has ordered the European Union's ambassador to leave the country for meddling in its domestic affairs. According to authorities, Ambassador Oliver Nett was harmful to the country while clarifying that Benin has nothing against the EU. Oliver has also been accused of constantly calling on civil society to protest against the government. Benin is not the only African country to go down the path of expelling meddlesome diplomats. Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Somalia have also recently thrown out ambassadors. Shifting gears now, China has warned the United States that it will retaliate following Washington's latest show of support for pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong. The warning came after U.S. President Donald Trump signed the Human Rights and Democracy Act into law, which mandates an annual review of China's autonomy status with the U.S. The U.S. signing of the so-called Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act into law seriously interferes in Hong Kong affairs, seriously interferes in China's internal affairs, seriously violates international law and basic norms of international relations. It is a naked act of hegemony, and regarding the U.S.'s harming of China's interests, China will take strong measures and firmly retaliate. Iran's Ministry of Intelligence announced the arrest of agents affiliated with the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency who were allegedly involved in recent riots in Tehran. Authorities say the agents operated with CIA funding under the guise of being reporters. They were allegedly caught trying to collect information about the riots to transfer it abroad. Following violent protests, the Iranian people took to the streets of the capital in support of the government and in rejection of rioting. Millions of young people have registered to vote in the coming UK election following a huge push by the Labour Party. Our correspondent Pablo Navarrete has the details from London. The UK elections are a little over two weeks away and yesterday, Tuesday, saw the deadline for people to register to vote. Um, according to the figures released so far, uh, approximately 4.1 million people have registered to vote in the last five weeks. 
which is a rise on the 2.9 million figure uh, for the 2017 elections. In the last two days of the register to vote um, time period, Monday and Tuesday, apparently 1 million people registered to vote, with 660,000 registering just on the last day. Now, this follows uh, the intervention by uh, various people in British society, such as the famous um, artist, music artist Stormzy, on, on Monday, on Sunday, released a call on his Twitter account for people to register to vote and to vote for the socialist leader of the uh, opposition Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, in what was seen as a very significant endorsement. Um, other figures such as the Brit uh, England footballer Raheem Sterling uh, took to Twitter calling on people to vote to register and a little uh, late in the, on Tuesday with, uh, with only uh, less than two hours left for people to register, the uh, famous uh, British singer Adele also urged people to register to vote. Now, it, it's said by analysts that the um, new people that are registering to vote uh, are disproportionately young and this favours uh, the Labour Party, although um, polls uh, put Labour uh, significantly behind uh, the Conservatives um, at the moment. So we'll, we'll see what uh, effect these new uh, uh, registrants in the, on the electoral roll have in the election. Um, and which is on the 12th of December, so a little over two weeks away. That was our correspondent Pablo Navarrete bringing us to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching. present at every event of what our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Discover the cultural...